thank you for the invitation. My name is uh, Gunnar Inne, and I work for the Federation of Norwegian Industries. Uh, we are basically um, an industry employers federation um, that organizes basically all of the land-based industry sector in Norway. So it's everything from oil and gas contractors from to aluminium to chemical industries, uh, electrical industries, recycling, process industries, even hotels, uh, actually. Some historical hotels are part of our federation. Um, yeah, so, so it's a pretty broad organization, and many of these branches have uh, circular economy projects. So what I thought I could do today is to give you a brief introduction to what um, our companies and our federation does uh, within the field of circular economy. And I have focused on, um, on the process industry and waste management industry, but lots of these industries, like textiles and furniture, for instance, have their own circular economy projects. Well, I don't think I managed to switch slides. Okay. So, just to give you a brief introduction, our role is basically that we have contact with political authorities and public administrations. We, uh, we are um, set up in a way that we have committees from our uh, member members, also within the different branches. Uh, so they tell us what to do. So uh, I'm involved, for instance, with process industry and recycling industry, and we have um, committees from mem member companies, and they develop positions, political positions, together with us. And we also provide assistance to our members uh, in all kinds of cases that could be related to questions on waste, byproducts, chemicals, pollution control, how to interpret legislation, for instance, maybe political issues. Uh, and then we develop um, position papers and reports, suggestions for political measures. And we're also active in Brussels. We are members of uh, more or less 20 um, EU organizations. So, so in a way, you know, we, we are a very broad organization, so we have to make compromises on all kinds of political issues. Uh, so when we see the position from European organizations, for instance, we see that they differ a bit from industry branch to industry branch, but we have to make compromises within our federation. We also have Nordic cooperation within most sectors. So, uh, for instance, today I'm here and having a meeting with Nordic colleagues within the waste recycling sector. Uh, and that's always good to know what's happening in other uh, Nordic countries, because we have... Um, in, in a way, we are, we are set up um, in, in the same way, and we have uh, more or less the same systems. And it's always good to know what's happening. R&D, which is very relevant to, to circular economy in, uh, for instance, the process industry. Also, we, we don't... We don't engage in research products, so we can help our companies finding the right ways and be represented in, for instance, uh, reference groups or, and stuff like that. So, um, so, so we are also involved in some research projects. The process industry of Norway, they have set an ambition that by 2050, there should be no, no CO2 emissions from that industry. And that was developed as an input to an official committee set by our Ministry of the Environment. They set on a, a committee on green taxation, and they wanted input from the industry. What, what, what will the world look like in 2035 and 2050? And the process industry, they said that, well, by, by, um, by 2050, we will be uh, climate neutral, provided that certain measures are put in place. And as you can see here, this is, the, um, this is how they, uh, they picture the development. And carbon capture and storage is a big part of this. So if you're not able to develop carbon capture and storage, uh, this development will most likely not be... Um, uh, we will not see this development. Also, the use of biomass is very important. The use of hydrogen will be very important. Um, and this, this roadmap that we made for the process industry, that kind of sparked a similar process for all our industry branches, where they looked on what kind of measures do we need to develop industrially in a um, sustainable way the next 20, 30 years. So there was a huge production of roadmaps uh, within our federation where all looked at what, what do we need, what, where do we want to be uh, in uh, 10, 15, 20 years. Maybe a bit similar to what we heard from, from Finland, although we did it within our own federation. Um, and we also did this for recycling, the recycling industry, for instance. And I will come back to what the main outcome of this was at a later stage. So these roadmaps also pointed to what are 
what are our advantages? Um, because we, we like, I, th I think it's correct also that we, 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 we at least we like to look at Norwegian industry as, um, as world leaders within some fields of, uh, of the environmental issues and climate issues. And, and we, we also notice the development that in the future more people will probably like to buy environmental friendly goods. Uh, they will probably like to know a bit more about the environmental footprint of your production and your products. So in order to maintain our position, we need to take more actions in the field of circular economy and in the field of climate. And, and um, at first it was important to point out what are our advantages today. And some of our advantages in, I think in all the Nordic uh, region, at least, um, yeah, I, I think in all the Nordic region, is that we have, we have a quite predictable political system. Uh, this is stable, we don't, we have, don't have huge adjustments from one, one day to another. I mean, that's, our members, they tell us that that's the worst for them. If they don't know the development for the next five, ten years, it's very hard to make sustainable investments. So, you know, predictability, political predictability, it's, it's very, very important for the industry, and we, we, we tend to have that. We have a good cooperation, it's called it a tri-party uh, cooperation between the labor unions, the employers, and uh, the governments, where this, we sit down and discuss a lot of issues together, for instance, related to uh, work, work environment issues, uh, related to uh, the development of, of wages and salaries. That's a, a negotiation between the labor unions and employers uh, each year. So there's a, there a tight cooperation. I mean, we disagree, obviously, on many issues as well, but there's a tight cooperation between the labor unions and the employer sections in Norway. And in, um, in, in environmental policies and in, in, in industrial policies, many times we have the same positions. So, so uh, so there's a good, good cooperation and connection between uh, these sections, even though we don't agree on all issues. Uh, we have come quite far, not that far, but, but at least we have come quite far in, uh, in uh, the field of green public procurement. We have a regulation now that says that if, uh, also in all public procurements, environmental issues has to be part of your uh, weighing, and part of your uh, strategy for, for purchasing of goods and services. And it's supposed to be weighed at least 30% when, uh, when you make a, a public purchase. So, so environmental issues always, will always be part of that, your criteria. Yes, and also, obviously, we need a competitive tax system for also our, our companies, our industry, they are worldwide. So in order to attract investments, there need to be a competitive tax system. That's not all of the, also that's not, that's not the only thing that matters, of course, but it's important. And we need to have access to renewable energy at competitive terms. So all these are, are part of it we have already, part of it we need to develop more in the future. But that's important for the development of green industry. Related to, to waste, I think, um, so this is obviously a very complex picture, but this, we, we made a study on circular economy in the process industry recently. I think it was published a half a year ago. And this graph shows uh, the development of ordinary waste generation, not hazardous waste, but ordinary waste, and value added in the Norwegian uh, process industry. And it, the graph lies a little bit because you can see that there's been a, there's been a change in how you define the byproducts in 2008 in Norway. So that's, that explains part of this, um, this reduction. But still, I think it's been many projects in the process industry that has reduced uh, ordinary waste generation. And, 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 um, and I think in this, in this sector, it's also an indicator of growth. If you can reduce your waste uh, amounts, you, will also, you don't have to pay for landfilling. Maybe you can get some, someone to pay a little bit for those um, previous waste streams. So these results have come as part of definition, a change in definitions for sure but also as a result of long-term R&D in the process industry. And some of these projects that reduces waste amounts, they, they start like 20 years before it's actually operational in the, in the companies. They start researching, and then 20 years later, later they, can, they can see the result in their, in, their, um, in their operations. So it's a matter of having a long-term perspective, I think, on many of these projects, and, and uh, have patience, because it takes time to, to make the, this, these things operational. And it's also important to remember, at least our companies tell us that, that 
This is not something that they make a lot of money from. They can reduce some waste management costs, maybe. Uh, and in the long term, they will maybe gain some money. But this will come in addition to their operations, day-to-day -day operations. And it's not like they will, they will see economic results on this from day one. They have to think very, in a very long, term, uh, very long term to see the results on this. This shows also uh, the, the development in the process industry only. Uh, now, this is actually for land-based industry, the entire land-based industry. Here you can see that the recycling increases for the waste streams. The installation is going down. The landfill is going slightly down. And also, they deliver more. This is uh, percentages, of course. And they also deliver more to the sorting facilities. And this is when you have taken away the waste, uh, the, the streams that were, was previously defined as waste that are now byproducts. So that means that the easiest material streams that are easiest to find uh, ways to, 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 exploit, also to, to exploit the resources are not included in these statistics. So even though you take away the easiest material streams, you still have an increase uh, of what's recycled in the, in the, in the land-based industry. And I think that's, that's because you know, they have, um, in the land-based industry in Norway, they have huge amounts of waste in one facility. So it's easier to say that in this facility, we will develop a project that will reduce the waste, uh, waste amounts in this, this, this region, this area. It's not like, for instance, commerce, trade, the retailers, uh, where they have very small amounts of waste uh, in one shop, for instance, and where this is, to a lesser degree, part of their economic results. In the process, in the Lambeth industry, you have huge amounts of waste at one spot, and it's probably easier to do something about it then, and it's easier to see the economic results of the initiatives. It's a bit difficult to... Uh, maybe I'm doing something wrong with this. <laughs> yeah. Also, we include the graph of hazardous waste in... Um, uh, and that's mainly because we have lots of discussions on hazardous waste in Norway at the moment. But as you can see, the, the volumes of hazardous waste increase in Norwegian society. And it also increases to some extent in the land-based industry. And, and to me, uh, and to us uh, in Norwegian Federation, that's, that's not necessarily a bad sign, you know? Because it means that we have more of the materials that was previously defined as ordinary waste is now hazardous waste, because there's been a change in the classification systems in the EU. So, so it's a matter of uh, a waste that was not previously defined as hazardous is now hazardous, because we accept a smaller concentration of chemicals in the waste before it's defined as hazardous. So to me, that's not, that's not really a bad sign for the environment. That only says that we accept uh, less chemicals in our, in our ordinary waste. Also, you know, um, uh, the development of new BAT criteria, so um, best available techniques criteria in the EU, that means that less, uh, we have less emissions to, to water and air, so more chemicals remain in sludge and waste. So when we release less chemicals to the atmosphere, for instance, from a, from a, um, a production facility, more, more of the chemicals has to remain somewhere because they don't go away. So, so in a way, it's also the, the reasons why uh, we have see an increase in hazardous waste is also because we release less to air and soil and water. So that that just to give you a full picture of the situation in Norway now. This is probably what's uh, being most discussed. You know, the the recycling of ordinary waste in in total. So you can see that the recycling is uh, dropping a little bit, uh, and the recycling of what we call municipal waste in uh, in the EU is, is more or less stable, has been more or less stable with a slight increase over the last years. Our big issue now is basically related to construction demolition waste, um, where we, we, we find it harder and more difficult to, to, um, to use concrete as, as backfilling material. And that's also because our authorities allow for less chemicals in the concrete now than previously, and there's more requirements related to documentation of, of uh, contamination in, in concrete waste before you're allowed to use it, for instance, in construction works, road buildings, etc. Et so, so here also, it's, it's, it's a trade-off between resource efficiency and the, the level of chemicals you're allowed to have, have in your concrete in order to use it. So it's not a one-sided picture, but 
in total. Uh, landfilling is going up because more concrete is landfilled. Uh, but at the same time, we recycle more food waste, for instance, we recycle more plastics. So it's not a one-sided picture. It's very complicated. Behind these numbers, there's lots of, uh, lots of explanation for the numbers, basically. But that's the situation as of today. So our, our, when we develop all these positions and roadmaps, we try to point out some, some measures that we need for, for to increase the recycling. We want to have requirements for the separate collection of recyclable waste in households, in industries, and in businesses. And that's actually been proposed by the Norwegian Environmental Agency. It now lies with the Ministry of the Environment before it's supposed to be sent on a public hearing. This, always, this also follows from the EU uh, Waste Directive, of course. Uh, we need to, uh, to develop you know, the green public procurement uh, requirements, so we can also require uh, I mean, a, a content of recycled materials, for instance, when you purchase a, a good or a, or a service. So, and how to document this is important for us. How can you document that your product actually contains this and that much percentages of recycled material? Because you need to have that kind of documentation methods before you start using it. But that will come. Our agency on, on uh, public procurement have developed a guideline on this. So, so the, what should I say? The, the wheels are in motion. We are, we are working on this. And I think in one or two years, we will have procurements from the public that will ask for circular economy aspects. We are preoccupied with standardization on a European or international level to document these product properties that we need in the future. And I think also we need a simplification, harmonization of the EU regulations related to, for instance, transboundary movements of waste, interfaces of products, chemicals and waste, definitions, uh, what's a byproduct when you fulfill the end of waste criteria. Um, and, and it seems like, uh, at least at, uh, I think in Norway and in the European Union, probably in all countries, many legislation processes start with a, a wish to simplify things. I mean, I work for the state government myself. Uh, we always started we need to simplify this regulation. But then it adds, it, it always comes in new aspects. What about this? What about that? But here's a loophole. And in the end, you end up with a regulation that's even more complicated than the ones you started with. But at some point, I think we need to see that we, we actually have some simplifications of at least our national regulations and also EU regulations. This I've said, this is a new publication on circular economy uh, and how to strengthen um, our position within the circular economy. One point, if I may, just to, even though my time is up, as a, I think one major point for us is to have cooperation between industry parks. We see that many, uh, many circular economy products, they develop from cooperation within industry parks because they know of each other's waste streams, they know of each other's processes, and it's easier to say, oh, you have that waste stream. Well, I can actually use this in my production. And, and um, so we have lots of industry clusters, lots of industry parks, and within these parks, there's, lo there's lots of activities within, within the circular economy. These are some examples, I'm not going through this. We also have some examples of R&D priorities that we think should be developed in the circular economy. That's product design, uh, low emission products, industrial symbiosis in parks, of course, new technologies, recycling, cost efficiency, not to say the least. But, but m most of the activities for the process industry start in clusters and in industrial parks. We also have some thoughts on support in the also support instruments, uh, instruments for economic support. Um, and you can say that for the industry, uh, we can never get enough economic support. <laughs> that goes without saying. I, I think I think that's um, you will always want more economic support, of course. But I think one of, the, one of the key things for us is that you need some kind of financial support, support for first-of-a-kind investments. If you take a risk as an industry, if you take a risk as a company, you need to have some kind of backing from um, the state to, to make it more easy to say, yes, we will actually go for this, we will take this risk, we will develop a new technology. And, and to some extent, we have this, but we need to, I think what we lack in Norway is that we don't follow this investment process from the start, from the research, towards the testing at the industry plant, and in the end, for the commercialization of a product or service. You need to have financial support for all this, this time span. And, and, and yeah, we don't, we don't have that yet, but we're working with the government to, to have this. 
So that's a bit of what we're working with in, uh, in Norway, and it's a broad field, of course. We feel that we have come a certain way, and there's, there's plenty of more things to do, but, but I, can, I can just to, just to finish. Um, when we started working on circular economy in Norway with the process industry, and we said, can you give us some examples? Can, can you, can you, do you have examples of what you do? Do you have research activities? Do you have something that we can use to watch our authorities? They said, no, we, we don't really have anything. We, 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 we're not in the circular economy. And then we said, yeah, but don't you use it for the byproducts? Don't you have the symbiosis in the parks? Don't you, don't, do you do something with your waste? I mean, you have to do something. And they said, oh, is that, in the, is that the circular economy? Oh, they, yeah, then we have plenty of examples. So, so for them, they, this is not something new. This is something that they have worked on for many, many years. But I think the, the focus and, and the attention to circular economy has lifted some of the projects in the companies that they were not able to, to prioritize previously. But now they can do it because now they're they like giving a spark from the authorities, from us, from the society, that, and they lift the circular economy projects a bit higher on the company's agenda. But this is, this, this is not something entirely new to them. They have been working this for quite some time, but we see that they are, these projects are more prioritized now in the companies than they were previously. So that's probably a good sign for us working with the circular economy. All right, I think that was it. I hope you got a, got a brief introduction to what we do in Norway. And uh, if there are any questions, then you're, of course, very welcome to, to, um, yeah, to raise them. Thank you. Thank you, Gunnar. Ja kellel on saalis Gunnarile küsimusi, et siis tõske käsi ja mikrofon tuleb teie juurde. Arglikult käed. Uh, thank you. The question concerning the international trade, your amazing uh, uh, but you you gonna, gonna go ne next uh, decades. Uh, if we look at the uh, international trade of Norway, how do you see uh, how it changes? Uh, I mean, uh, when the, 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 the biggest, biggest articles are oil and, and oil products, and how do you see yeah. your international trade is changing uh, during this path, and uh, what mm -hmm. the replacements you see yeah. in this, uh, uh, in this uh, balance? Oh, oh. That's, uh, that's a very good question. I'm not sure I have a complete answer to that, but obviously we know that at, at one point in time, you know, we, we're not, I'm not sure that will come in many decades still, but, but at one point in time, uh, oil and gas will, be, uh, uh, will not be part of our, uh, our uh, export anymore. I think it will take lots of time, but, but at one point we need to have something else. So, so I think we're still in the process of developing that, but I think also at least I, I, I used to say that yeah, because, because there's lots of, uh, lots of um, discussion going on on how many workplaces can we create, for instance, with circular economy. Is it 15,000, 50,000 new workplaces and, and stuff like that? To me, I think the circular economy project and the increase in, uh, in other in industry sectors, that will come mainly from within of existing industry today. Maybe, for instance, the, um, the oil and gas contractors today, they have they have um, they, they work now, for instance, on uh, on uh, wind, uh, also the creation of wind power uh, in the sea, and uh, we have they, they work with uh, fisheries and ag agriculture, so they find new markets, but they build on the competence they have from the oil and gas sector, and also you mean I mean um, maybe the mining industry will be more dominant in Norway in years to come, but I think the the transition will come from existing industries to, to a large extent. I, I don't believe that we will have lots of new, uh, at least for, for many decades, I don't think we'll have a complete transition to something completely new. We see that lots of the industry projects that create workplaces come from within existing industries, but they develop into new markets like aquaculture, uh, wind, uh, wind, also sea wind, uh, of, uh, ocean wind, offshore, offshore wind and stuff like that. So, but there is a transition, but mainly within existing industry. I don't know, I hope that answers your questions a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Võibolla ma ei näe. Aga kas on Marleenale küsimusi? Et andke julgelt käega märku, et siis saab mikrofon teie juurde tulla. Thank you, Gunnar.